Hello, I'm Adam Mayberry, and welcome to Spotlight on Sparks. This show looks at how city services protect your quality of life, starting with job one, public safety. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Fine. I'm Michelle of the Sparks Fire Department. Project safe. Thank you. Hello. The Salernos are one of the many families in Sparks to receive such a visit from the Sparks Firefighters. They are here today for one reason. Two people live in this home, but only one smoke alarm. Oh, the investment of a smoke detector in your house, in every bedroom in your house, and centrally located in the hallway, is just immeasurable compared to anything else. According to national fire statistics, each year 70% of home fire deaths can be attributed to missing or not working fire alarms. In Sparks, Project SAFE just installed another smoke alarm, protecting another Sparks family. And this will be good because with his hearing aids and then upstairs and then the windows and then just the variety of things. The immediate wake up. If we can get people to wake up right away and get out, then we can focus on saving their house. Project SAFE, or Survive a Fire Emergency, is the brainchild of Sparks Fire Marshal Bob King. He wanted to install smoke alarms in homes built before 1994. He and his colleagues found and won a federal grant to fund nearly 1,000 detectors, batteries, and installation. For the Salernos, Project SAFE brings some peace of mind. For Fire Marshal King, Project SAFE is personal the result of a tragedy he'll never forget. Um, unfortunately, in, in our community, in 2006, we had a residential fire where we had the loss of two teenage sisters in that fire. And during the investigation of the fire, we did find that the house did not have sufficient smoke alarms. It was an older house, and they didn't have them in every bedroom and in the hallways like they do nowadays. Out of the tragedy of two lives lost, now, so many thousands in Sparks are better protected than they were. Now we're into the installation part of our program and we're installing smoke alarms in all the older homes in the city of Sparks first. At a recent open house, Sparks firefighters welcomed more than 500 residents into their house, Fire Department Headquarters Station, for breakfast. Mayor Gina Martini was among many civil servants happily serving citizens at this annual pancake fundraiser. Proceeds benefit Sparks fire victims and fund fire prevention efforts. Hosted by the Sparks Fire Prevention Bureau, this was the event's 21st year. Firefighters used to sit down to talk to neighbors about fire safety and teach them about prevention. From a burning house to the do's and don'ts of grease fires, there was lots to see and do. The fire department's average response time is six minutes. Knowing how to safely handle different kinds of household fires is your best protection from serious burns or worse. Outside the pancake breakfast, firefighters demonstrate skills they use all too often. How to tear apart a car to save a person inside. The jaws of life grind through the metal in seconds. The new tool is faster and easier to use than older ones. It's a real asset in preserving lives. The tools that the firefighters are using are acquired on a grant that we received. We've only had them for the last one or two years, and they're a lot lighter than the tools we were using before. The old tools are about 70 pounds. These are about 45. In less than two minutes, the jobs bite the doors off their hinges hopefully giving access to passengers. But sometimes expectations aren't so simple. Sometimes firefighters need to remove the roof.
like the fire department's new Jaws of Life. The police department's newest bomb technology is also both the result of federal grants and a shared regional asset. A lot of that stuff has been uh, obtained through grants that have been pursued through a regional effort. We have a lot more success pursuing federal monies through, through regional initiatives than individually. So it works very well when we're trying to obtain those high dollar items to pursue it through a consolidated unit like that. At the department's annual open house, the bomb squad demonstration draws in wide-eyed kids, giving officers a chance to talk with them. Close down that lid, and I'm going to drive it out someplace where I can blow it up. I want to know about that. And this gives us an opportunity to show all the things, all the capabilities we have, the equipment we have, um, the people, get to know folks. At the meet and greet, citizens check out the mobile command center, another regional resource. The 911 dispatch center is open for tours. They're close for inside. and parents can have identification cards made for their children. Sometimes um, police officers get a bad rap and I think they need to see that there's some good going on here. We do a lot of things that people don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily aware that we do, whether it's uh, bike patrol, motors, SWAT, uh, mounted patrol. Each officer owns their own horse. They keep them and maintain them on their own. So at the end of the open house, What's the take-home message to residents? But basically, I think people, what I want people to know or we want people to know is that regardless of our situation, we will always fight and battle and do our best to keep people safe. Uh, we will never quit. A dog is an officer's best friend when it comes to catching criminals. Many suspects surrender quickly when police dogs are focused right on them. And for obvious reasons, Sparks Police Open House continues with a canine unit demonstration. Well, we have uh, three kits and thought it would be a great thing to do. We knew there were going to be some great demonstrations here. Um, I think it also gives us a, nice, a chance to sort of support some of the things that are going on in the community. The highly trained service dogs assist the department with finding suspects, drugs, and other evidence that could possibly be overlooked if it weren't for the dog's sensitive noses. Officers appreciate every advantage. But this is a challenging environment. We have a 24-hour town. We have casinos, large access to alcohol. Um, we're, we're close to, to larger cities. All those things contribute to um, a higher call volume for us than maybe other, other entities our size. The city's two police dogs are trained to bite as an apprehension tool, but only in specific circumstances. They are often a deterrent to people who may run from officers, or even fight them. So, after a full round of crime-fighting dogs, bomb removal robots, car crunching jaws, and tours of 911 dispatch and a mobile command unit, are residents pleased with the city's public safety services? Unbelievable professionalism. These, these guys are just un unbelievable. I'm very impressed with the operation of the Sparks Police Department right now. Now I want you to meet a different crime-fighting Sparks team. It's a team known to fight felons right here in this urban jungle, all to protect your property. When Scott Robbins left Burgess Park for the night, he knew for a fact it was clean of all graffiti. An early morning check would have found that overnight taggers had filled up the blank canvases he'd cleaned the night before. Instead, it's Ron Corman who calls in the graffiti at Bridges Park. Graffiti in Sparks is a big problem. We spend in excess of $100,000 a year uh, trying to remove and abate uh, graffiti. Robin's workday already started at a local construction company. Overnight, they've been hit too. This time, Haggers did thousands of dollars in damages to private property. Corman explains the city's initial response is the same for both private and public property damage. Take pictures and file a report. At Burgess Park, Robbins is cleaning walls before noon. For the construction company hit this morning and private property owners, things aren't so simple. If it's on private property, then we will come to your property. We will um, 
take the report, we'll take pictures, and then we'll put a door hanger on the uh, residents to let the owners or the uh, uh, residents know that we've been there and taken our report. And then it's up to them to remove the graffiti from that property. Tagging fines are $180 each, the city's cost of cleanup. That adds up to put the most prolific lawbreakers into felony charges. Regional cooperation aims to bust the baddest of the bottle sprayers. The city of Reno, Washoe County, and the city of Sparks all collaborate and use a program that the city of Reno created is a database for graffiti. And uh, our report and pictures go into that database where it's sorted to like uh, graffiti markings. And then if somebody gets caught sometime uh, in the future, then we go back into that database and compare it to similar uh, graffiti tags. And then uh, the person is prosecuted based on what's in that database that's of that same uh, tag. Yet in the end, technology is the best bet for winning the war against graffiti. Like this unmarked building, it's been treated so the surface will not accept taggers' paint. You know, is there an end in sight? Yeah, there probably is as technology improves and the easier and faster it is to remove it, then it sort of takes the, the impact out of, of what they're doing. Public safety is job one in Sparks. So what's job two? The answer's coming up. And Audi Boulevard just became a city street. What improvements can you expect? The next flood is just a matter of time. The New Year's Day flood of 1997 caused some $500 million in damages and led to the layoffs of some 800 people and affected 15,000 additional jobs. With local devastation like that, preventing flooding is a priority for the city of Sparks. The city has invested millions of dollars in your safety. 100 new concrete culverts measuring 10 feet by 6 feet move water from the north side of I-80 and Sparks Boulevard to the south side where it can safely flow into the river downstream and away from the Sparks industrial area. This is a significant piece and a much larger flood prevention effort by the Truckee River Flood Project. We've got the Flood Project, which is a $1.6 billion project, the biggest flood project in the western United States at this time. It's a moment to celebrate for Sparks. The council is pleased with the drain work to protect these businesses and people in Sparks from a 100-year flood event. You know, obviously my ward flood control is critical because a great deal of the industrial area is very important. And, and, you know, that's really about dollars. For those businesses individually, it's also about dollars for the city. We can't afford to have the same kind of flood events that we've had in the past. We need to make sure that we're protecting those city assets and that we're taking care of what's important for us and our citizens and our businesses. If job one is public safety, then job two is definitely taking care of the roads. If there's anything Sparks residents dislike more than potholes, it's traffic. Widening Vista to four lanes is a big improvement in quality of life for local drivers. The $10 million project removed a bottleneck, improved capacity, and improved safety at the curves. The question has always been, when are we going to get the four lanes out the Wayneville? And now it's done. Um, everybody's happy with it. And while you may not notice the drainage improvements, you're sure to see the new 10-foot wide pedestrian bike path. As part of a program called Complete Streets, an overall effort to improve the look of city streets, work on Vista also raised the landscape for medians. It's looking good and it's green. Irrigation for the new landscaping uses recycled water. All this work was paid for by RTC5 funds, approved by voters back in 2008. And I want to thank the Sparks voters also and the voters of Washoe County because when they voted for RTC5, that's where the funds came from. And everybody knows it's about money right now. 
And it just goes to show you, if you explain something well enough to the voters, they're smart enough to say, you know what, that is a good deal. Another sore spot for drivers is Pyramid Highway and the McCarran intersection. The busy crossroads links Spanish Springs to I-80. It's ranked the third worst for congestion out of 66 intersections in the region. The RTC is studying a few alternatives to improve the intersection. Both the RTC and the city are talking to neighbors before building. I would think that it, within the next two years that project will get underway. Uh, right now we're still doing the EIS studies. Um, we're also uh, meeting with the folks that are impacted by this, which is a big deal. You know, uh, there's people live along Pyramid Highway there that they can't sell their houses even if they weren't underwater because people think there's a road going through. So we have meetings scheduled with them and, and we're going to get their uh, input. The city of Sparks wants the intersection made safe as soon as possible. The congested crossroads are quite dangerous. In just two years, the intersection saw 361 crashes. The city's Complete Streets program is on the move. East Victorian Avenue recently got a $4.4 million facelift. The thing that makes me so excited about it is that the people who live in my neighborhood are proud. This project really brought a sense of neighborhood pride in terms of how much it's dressed up the neighborhood, the landscaping, the street lighting, the nice white boulevard sidewalks. Uh, what matters is that we got it done and I'm looking forward hopefully to doing some more like this. This is a quality of life issue that we're looking at right here. The city and the RTC teamed up to connect Victorian Square to the Marina Park. Along the way they made lane improvements for cars, added landscaped 10-foot paths for bikes and pedestrians and decorative lighting. Even local businesses got additional street parking. For some, like Councilwoman Raddy, it's just about home. Obviously this investment on Victorian Avenue that we've recently been able to complete is really exciting for me because that's why I got involved, is to make sure that we were putting some dollars and putting some time and energy into the older part of Sparks. It's tremendous. It just spruced up uh, the Victorian Avenue so much. Uh, it's called a complete street. We've got places for uh, bicyclists. Uh, you know, it's family friendly. And again, it goes to uh, quality of life in the city of Sparks. It's a wonderful project, and we want to do more of them if we can. Next time you're in Victorian Square, visit Sparks Railroading Pass. Check out the Sparks Heritage Museum and the newly renovated train exhibit. Construction of complete streets is just the start. Taking care of these streets in wicked weather is a vital core city service. Yeah, they don't see us out there at nighttime. You know, they're, they're in bed sleeping and we're out there, you know, putting the salt and sand down, trying to, you know, make it safe for them to go get to work. Dan Hamlin gets up in the dark early morning to keep you safe and traffic moving. He dispatches the city's eight snow plow operators. The first stop, Joe Gandolfo Arena on the east side of Sparks. This is the city's main stockpile of salt and sand. The trucks use a spinner to throw the mix onto the roads. It's a big job with 600 plus miles of road to clear and sand. We do the, the main roads first, and that's, again, that's for the PD and that's for fire to make sure that they can get their trucks, trucks out to these areas. So we, we do those and clean those up first, and then we'll go in, like they do the secondary roads. And uh, we very rarely have enough time to get into residentials, and we don't do cul-de-sacs. And uh, another thing, don't, don't pass the snow plows. You know, we're out there trying to clear the roads and put sand on there so you have some traction. And if you pass this, then you don't have any sand on the road for you. So please, don't you know, give us some room. Stay, stay back. If possible, don't drive at all during snow day. Stay home. It's safety. You know, it's getting the kids home from school. It's getting people at home safe and sound. You know, you don't want to see anybody get, get, getting wrecks and getting hurt. Plow operators also ask you not to pile snow in the street while clearing sidewalks or driveways. And don't throw snow on storm drains. The reason? If it freezes, then when it starts to melt out, the water has a hard time getting in those drains. Do you know what ward you live in? Still to come on Spotlight on Sparks, news from your neighborhood. Now it's time for news from your neighborhood. Let's check in with the city council, see what they're working on. You know, coming up uh, real soon, Adam, I think is gonna be, uh, the legislature is gonna be in session. 
So we're going to be watching very closely and working, trying to work with our legislators. We've already been reaching out to them uh, to talk to them about the session that's coming up and uh, show them what kind of budget problems that we have and uh, what we face in the future. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, we've got enough uh, police on the streets and uh, you know we're working very hard on our budget now to make sure that we can do that. Same with firemen. We need to protect our citizens against fire and, and crime with our police department. So, to me, those are the major things. You know, always is going to be traffic and uh, congestion and those kind of things. We're working on several projects uh, through RTC. The Southeast Connector is one, and uh, you know, Pierman McCarran has got to be fixed sooner than later. So, those are some of the big things that uh, that are on my plate and uh, that I'm going to be looking at in the next 18 months. I think the first thing that I'd like folks to know is that the City Council is putting a tremendous amount of thought and a tremendous amount of debate and working with our management team to really focus on what are the essential services, the core services that we must provide as a city. And then what can we do to make sure that we maintain our quality of life beyond that. Resources are very thin right now. Well, we're at an exciting moment in time for Audi Boulevard for the City of Sparks. Audi, the Audi Boulevard corridor used to be a state road and we've recently finished all the processes that make it now belong to the City of Sparks and that means that we can start to work on it in terms of revitalizing that, revitalizing that stretch of road. I don't think I'm saying anything that anybody doesn't know that it maybe isn't the best looking uh, part of uh, in terms of our transportation infrastructure and the sidewalks and the paths on the side of it and so it'll take time but we're definitely working in partnership with the RTC to do what we can do to advance the Audi Boulevard corridor and redevelopment in that area. Well, I'm absolutely focused on neighborhood preservation, and that's what I've wanted to do since I was elected. The challenge, of course, is we have fewer resources at the city than we used to have a few years ago, and for us to really make progress on neighborhood preservation, it's going to have to be citizen engagement. We really get, need to get to the place where we have neighborhood watch, where we had neighborhood cleanup groups, where our community comes together and help us. Absolutely, we need to do our job on code enforcement. We need to do our job on investing in our older communities. But with the resource environment that we're in, volunteerism is really going to make the difference here. As the Vice Chair of Redevelopment, I definitely want to keep the focus back on Victorian Square. I've been working with Councilman Ron Smith to make sure that we are making progress. Um, I think everybody really understands today how critical special events are to our economy, to bringing tourists to the region, to making sparks on the map. And so we are really looking at what improvements can we make that help accelerate and improve the special events environment in Victorian Square. A lot of people have said, you know, you're, you're crazy getting into becoming a councilman at this time because of the economy. Well, <clears throat> I think this is a perfect time to be a, a, a councilman in this type of an economy because it, it brings out people's character and it brings out what's the good part of them. And I think that I have those abilities to make some good decisions that will help the city move forward. Now, at one point, City of Spark was the easiest place to do business. Well, we were quickly getting a reputation in the business community as not being the easiest place to do business. We need to change that perception. So now is the time to cut it off before it grows into a, a, a big problem, is to cut it off, provide better services for our, our businesses, and um, that's my main concern right now, is just to see how we can, and, and I've seen some good changes so far, is uh, provide a higher level of service to our customers from the city standpoint and our customers are the people and the small business owner. Right now the, the focus really really needs to be on getting our people back to work, bringing businesses here. Well you know the economy is our biggest uh, enemy right now, uh, getting people back to work. Um, getting them to be able to put food on their tables and, and take care of their families. It, that's, that's tough nationwide, not just here in Sparks. So I, I think one of the priorities we have to have is, is getting people back to work. No matter how we do that, we get people back to work. Well, I can tell you that I made a commitment when I became redevelopment chair to do the best I could to get redevelopment, some kind of redevelopment started down there. We've realigned all the properties down there, so if, if a developer comes in, we're ready to go. And so we're set when this economy turns around. But the other things we're doing right now is we're talking about putting in a, an event, open air event center in, in, uh, um, in the center down there. We've got a piece of property between the two roads we just put in. That'd be great for a public ice skating rink. We've got, uh, of course, we, we've got a whole bunch of things that are working uh, together. It's the branding, it's redevelopment, and, and it's um, uh, construction projects that we have going in the city of Sparks that aren't going on anywhere else. 
we've got the Southeast Connector, which will alleviate the traffic problems. And what people don't realize is that Southeast Connector, all of our traffic, all of our roads that have been built in the past were all based on the fact that we would have that Southeast Connector. So we're working on that. I think one of the things that everybody was looking forward to was the widening of Vista. And, you know, I'd been working on that project for nine years. And to be real honest, now that it's widened, I, I, I don't get very many calls. There's not too many uh, complaints, except that everybody wants to raise the speed limit now. And that's not going to happen because, uh, you know, basically RTC set it at what the roads can, can handle. But I think the thing I'm going to work on the most is that, you know, Cotty Ranch had a nice business park. And unfortunately, the Cotty went bankrupt. There, there's a company coming in that's trying to take it out of bankruptcy right now. And they've got some leads on some companies that want to relocate from California and Oregon here in Nevada. Because our atmosphere here, as far as businesses go, is a lot better than California and a lot better than Oregon. So that's what I'm going to be concentrating on. And that is I'm going to probably have to you know, be a salesman for the city of Sparks and get some business parks here. Because you get a business park here, we get, first of all, the, the jobs that we need, and we start building up Kylie again. And I think that's going to be my, uh, my focus now. I think that the, the whole concept of the City of Sparks and our tours of marketing and what we do for attracting visitors in the area and, and visitor type development uh, is obviously something we have to continue um, developing throughout the city. It's been a, in the history of who we are, special events. Uh, we've done a great job with the Legends Project, bringing that on in and bringing more tours to our area for, for shopping. We need to continue those themes, continue looking at all the things that are going to increase tourism and the importation of tax dollars, tax dollars from other communities. Um, that's the lifeblood of who we are until we can go ahead and change our economy to something other than warehousing and tourism. You know, if we can bring in uh, high-tech development or, uh, or, or uh, biotech, things like that, we're going to continue relying on the tourism marketing. We need to continue all the efforts we do to make that happen. I think we've got, I mean, it's a responsibility. I mean, it's our responsibility to develop our city, to develop the type of industry we want to be here and what we want the city to look like in the next century. And so economic development is very, very important. We need to decide what, we, what type of industry we want to bring on in, not leave that to other people to go and decide, as we've done in the past, but take a, take a very active role in that. And, um, you know, I think we can do it. To learn more about the City of Sparks, log on to www.cityofsparks.us. I'm Adam Mayberry. Thanks for watching.